della serata eh, io dovrei fare l'introduzione ma la salto perché tutti abbiamo eh, voglia di sentire tra le parole di Daniel Lipeschi la sua uh, legge signori io sono veramente emozionato anche perché ho sempre reputato il professor ebraico di Lipeschi una delle quattro opere seminali del, degli ultimi vent'anni quindi il fatto di averlo qui per noi è un grande onore eh, Daniel Molti 
anni dopo che lui eh, si era, eh, aveva iniziato a occuparsi di architettura ed è un eh, progetto simbolico eh, che eh, doveva riportare in vita la tradizione del popolo ebraico proprio in quel posto che era eh, il centro dell'annientamento del popolo ebraico. I to also share with you really the manifesto uh, which is in my passport because I did not get a permission, a visa uh, to work in Germany. Uh, in my passport, uh, which is American, was inscribed the statement that I should build what at that time was called the extension to the Berlin Museum, the Jewish Museum. Of course, it's easy to say it, but it was six different governments, the unification of Germany, a very difficult project which took many, many years to realize. Dunque, eh, ci fa, eh, questa è una cosa curiosa, cioè il, il, lui non ha mai ricevuto all'epoca un visto eh, di ingresso eh, in Germania, ma un visto specificamente finalizzato alla realizzazione, alla progettazione e alla realizzazione del eh, museo eh, dell'Olocausto. Ma è molto difficile perché uh, bisogna capire che a un punto there was a unanimous vote of the Berlin Parliament not to build the building. La difficoltà nasceva dal fatto che a un certo punto c'era stato un voto unanime nel Parlamento tedesco per non costruire l'edificio. So, uh, architecture is really a matter of, uh, as I see, of belief. Uh, it's not just a matter of working hard, it is a matter of a kind of uh, commitment which may be uh, not easy. Allora l'architettura non è semplicemente un lavorare duro, ma è un, uh, una questione di impegno ideale. But it is also, of course, a spiritual expression. Uh, it is about light. It's about the light not only in the space, but the light in the mind, the light in the soul. L'architettura è un fatto spirituale, è un gioco di luce, ma non è solo un gioco di luce dentro l'architettura, ma è un gioco di luce dentro la mente, dentro lo spirito. I want to show you a picture of my father who is dead now, but he came to Berlin. He was the first of my family. Many people who are Jewish did not want to come to Germany. But my father came and he sat in the void of the museum and he said, you know, there is a future. Even though there is a void, there is an absence, but there is also a light of the future. I always thought that's an important personal picture, but I wanted to share it with you. Allora, ha voluto eh, condividere con noi questa fotografia del padre ormai scomparso che eh, è è andato a Berlino, si è seduto nel, nel grande vuoto centrale dell'edificio e ha detto sì c'è un grande vuoto ma c'è anche un futuro. And of course a building has many aspects, uh, many symbolic aspects. I believe that a building is a symbolic entity. Every building is a story, it does tell you a story. Sometimes the story is very short. It's superficial, sometimes it's just about the beauty of the world, sometimes the story is that the world is very stable, but in my view, the world is not so stable, the world is not so safe, the world is not just a story with a good or bad ending, it's a search for a meaning in this dynamic and unknowable world we are living in. I'll try that. <laughs> Del, della, della narrativa eh, di un edificio, di come un edificio è sia simbolico che eh, narrante e parla anche della eh, sua visione del mondo come una storia che non ha né un lieto fine né un fine eh, negativo, ma è una, una storia in divenire che non è neanche troppo eh, sicura. Another project in Germany, which will open uh, in October of this year, very different project. Uh, it's the city of Dresden, 
As you know, the city of Dresden was bombed uh, completely in World War II, and I won a competition for the National Historical Military Museum of Germany in Dresden. Allora, questo è un altro edificio in Germania, a Dresda, che è stata completamente distrutta durante la guerra ed è un edificio, è un museo militare, ma lasciate il museo, eh? Sì, il museo nazionale militare eh, a Dresda. Perhaps you know this photograph, it's a very sad picture uh, of the destruction of the city, of a complete uh, bombing of a city to nothingness. And by the way, Dresden was considered one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. Allora, questa è un'immagine che mostra la distruzione di Dresda, la distruzione che la, la città è più rasa al suolo, nonostante fosse una delle più belle città d'Europa. Uh, but also, uh, I recommend you read Victor Klemper, a survivor of one of the was the hope that the city will be bombed. And it was his only hope because it was his only hope to live. And he luckily lived as only very few survived. Uh, allora, questo è un libro di questo professor uh, Klemperer che uh, si augurava uh, che la città fosse distrutta perché uh, essendo ebreo vedeva uh, l'olocausto svolgersi di fronte ai suoi occhi e pensava che la distruzione avrebbe portato alla vita. This is the project of the National Military Museum and I want to show you the plan. It's the armory is a very famous uh, building in Dresden. It was always it was an armory built in the 19th century. It was then very quickly became a very famous National Military Museum of Germany that it became the Nazi Museum. Uh, of, of military history, it became the Soviet military museum in Germany, it became the East German military museum, and now of course in a new Germany, it is again a national museum of the military history. Allora, questo edificio è stato un museo militare eh, nel XIX secolo, è stato un museo militare eh, per eh, i nazisti, è stato un museo militare per i comunisti, e a lei, eh? Sì, sì, della Germania dell'Est e adesso con la nuova Germania riunificata è diventato un museo militare. Uh, I wanted to break the order of the museum, the chronological order that is in the museum, and I also wanted to create a force that shows and penetrates the museum to orient the public to something which is not so visible in the city which is the city itself and how it grew and also how it was destroyed. And uh, I have to just tell you this was a competition. All the architects on the competition built in the back of the building, preserving the historical uh, facade of the building. I cut the facade in two places, but very, very thin, only thin uh, lines across the facade. And I thought it was important to project people. The fact that the military in the democracy it should not be invisible, should be visible. People should see that the military is not something behind all 19th century walls, hidden behind, but in front. And people should really be participants of the decisions that, of course, Germany, other military nations are involved today in conflicts, NATO, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. Allora, dunque, eh, la sua strategia è stata quella di eh, voler interrompere, come dire, la, la continuità cronologica dell'edificio eh, nel, eh, nel concorso eh, per il progetto, la grandissima maggioranza dei progettisti eh, ha eh, scelto di edificare eh, la nuova ala eh, sul retro dell'edificio per non eh, per non toccare la facciata eh, esistente, invece lui ha fatto eh, un'azione eh, un diversa, cioè quella invece di proiettarsi eh, attraverso la facciata con eh, gli inserimenti molto piccoli ma che fossero visibili per testimoniare che in una democrazia l'azione e l'attività eh, militare deve essere visibile eh, al popolo. The museum has a completely different space. It is not orthogonal, it is not ordered, it's a reflection 
of within the military structure of order of a certain other point of view that makes people realize that wars are not just about equipment and military equipment, but they're about human decisions. And I really believe that architecture is not about abstraction, but it's really about human beings, it's about people. Allora, eh, gli spazi dell'edificio, come vedete, sono eh, diversi, non sono governati da una eh, geometria ortogonale. Eh, è, una, è un tentativo di eh, esprimere il fatto che l'attività militare non è semplicemente eh, governata dalla razionalità, ma è anche governata dai bisogni e, dalle, e, e dai desideri del genere. And uh, when the public traverses the museum, interrupted by this vector, the vector at the top of the building is not an arbitrary view. If you project the lines, it points to the three, the, this triangle points to the three points from which Dresden was bombed, which you saw in that first photograph. So it's a very, very important view of the people of Dresden, but also the invisible Dresden, which of course has arisen from the ashes. Allora dunque eh, l'esperienza che uno ha dello spazio eh, quando incontra questo vettore che interrompe la continuità del, dell'edificio esistente eh, eh, è un'esperienza che rimanda eh, eh, attraverso i tre vertici del vettore ai tre punti dai quali eh, la città di Dresda venne bombardata e rasa al suolo. So to me, very important is the aspect of memory, that a building is not only a place for today, but it's a place that traverses memory, which is often not visible any longer. It's hidden in the development of a city, and yet this underlying memory is the driving force, the driving spiritual and political force of the development or a demise of a city. Allora, eh, parla dell'edificio dell come un elemento di memoria, eh, e cioè di un'esperienza che eh, non, eh, non è eh, monodirezionale nel tempo, ma che eh, torna indietro e avanti a seconda di come l'esperienza storica eh, richiede. A very different project, it's a competition which I won in Switzerland and burned for a very big project. What do you do in the periphery of a city where you have all those, uh, you know, factories, commercial development? Uh, how do you do something which isn't just chaos, but create an, a, a new city really on the periphery, which is sustainable, which has a multiple program? Uh, I introduced not only the shopping center, but hotel, there's also housing uh, for the elderly, there are spas, there is entertainment, so it's really a new urban center. Uh, this is a project in Switzerland for the development of the periphery of the city, and the problem was to create a whole polyfunctional that was not only a great center commercial, but also dei centri benessere, un albergo, eccetera, che riuscisse a dare ordine al disordine urbano nella periferia. And of course it is a chance also to create new kind of architecture, these are uh, large swimming facilities that turn into nightclubs in the evening. Uh, it's of course in the landscape uh, uh, which is uh, very beautiful, it's a building which is also of wood, the hotel, it's a complex. And uh, it's, it's part of how to, how to organize the periphery of a city in a way that I think is sustainable, utilizing the air rights over highways rather than building on the ground. Allora, il problema era eh, quello di creare, eh, diciamo, un elemento che nel paesaggio portasse eh, un ordine eh, nuovo rispetto al disordine della periferia, è un edificio che, che portava che porta sostenibilità attraverso l'edificazione sopra, eh, so, over the highways, right? sopra le, eh, eh, le autostrade piuttosto che invadere lo spazio aereo. Can I ask, I know it's very late. Maybe I can only speak in English without a translation. Is that all right? Okay. Uh, a project in Dublin to regenerate uh, the water, the, the old canals of Dublin. You can see, the, the, I did the master plan which includes the piazza on the waterfront, 
the big uh, office buildings that support the public-private partnership to bring the big theater to Dublin. So it's the first large-scale uh, theater, 2,500 seats. It's a kind of a curtain, very efficient uh, floor plan with a kind of piazza that, that is the foreground uh, of, this, uh, of this theater and uh, a very dramatic but very uh, economical building because of course it, ha it has to have a very uh, a small uh, but effective uh, public space. At the same time, of course, it has to occupy a large space of the back of the house, the theater, and the machinery for opera, for different performances, and so on. Uh, so, again, a, a reference to, to Dublin, uh, the, the large office blocks, and uh, of course the creation of the piazza on the waterfront that has regenerated this part of Dublin, which of course is a beautiful city, uh, one which really needed music, uh, art, and even in these dark economic times, this is a very, very popular place for probably the largest urban design project in the world, uh, in the South Seoul, Korea. Uh, what do you do in the center of a 600-year-old city? How do you design a completely new, really, urban structure uh, in, in the center, on uh, the river, in, the, in a historical uh, uh, setting? My idea was to create archipelago, which means to break the large mass, which, con which contains about 75 large-scale buildings, cultural buildings, office buildings, residential buildings, schools, and so on, into a kind of archipelago with the green spaces that really begin to distort and deform the grid of the city and create identity for each area. And each area of the city, in my master plan, which is being uh, realized as we speak, is to be done by different architects with different ideas of materials, different ideas of living, different ideas of architecture expression. So you can see how large this is. This is a 64-acre site. It's about four times ground zero in New York. And you can see the complexity of programming, which, which contains a kind of a river of cultural and retail facilities with the business center, residential buildings on the river, and of course, how to create a new traffic pattern within this historical uh, I, I want to say it's very difficult to, to really explain uh, master plans, but the idea is to break the master plan into small, uh, really small uh, communities. Uh, I have to tell you how th this project is very big. It's about more than 30 billion euro to be finished by 2016. So it's, of course, Korea is competing with China, is competing with other uh, places in the region, and it's a very, very ambitious project. Uh, you can see that, that to organize buildings and organize public spaces and the car of the space is really part of the complexity of creating a new city which is not just an abstract tabula rasa in, in the grid but a city that is related to the mountains, to the river, to the green spaces and to neighborhoods which I think are the most important for people. This is another example in Singapore uh, where I was lucky to win a competition to develop Capital Bay, which you can see how to, how to maximize uh, the, the public spaces of the boardwalk, how to create green spaces, but also really high level density with about 24 buildings, six skyscrapers. Uh, the buildings themselves uh, are doubly curved uh, because they are thought from the inside out. I didn't want people just to live on top or below each other, but Every unit is a kind of floating space, in a unique position in space. And you can see that it's a complex organization of, of the dwellings, domestic units. There are the lower units, which are about 7 to 50 stories high, and the higher units, uh, higher towers, which are about 70 stories high. And of course, the composition is how to create light and a kind of tropical uh, green place, which, uh, which of course, uh, it recreates uh, the notion of living on this uh, bay of, of, of Singapore. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a project which is very radical because the buildings are not extruded straight, but every apartment has a feeling of being really on the water in the wind, in the tropical air of, of Singapore. And you can see it uh, in its neighborhood as it is being finished with the green crowns, which are very large. 
green uh, multi-story spaces, a kind of uh, uh, organic form in the window. In Milan, I was uh, lucky to be able to design uh, it for city life, the master plan, which well, the idea was to create a green uh, piazza in a city which has a lot of hardscape, to create a, a housing which, which has a scale and picks up the scale of the, of the historical uh, urban structure and creates, of course, in the center uh, large-scale buildings, uh, uh, office buildings and so on. And I'm working with Zaha, Isozaki and others to create really a neighborhood. Uh, and of course, uh, Milan uh, has high level uh, expectations in residential living. So how can one become, how can one introduce new ideas of light in the buildings, sustainable architecture, sustainable buildings, and create really a place that, that takes advantage of one of the really beautiful cities of the world, which I truly admire, Milan. Uh, I was, I'm also doing uh, the Arduino Tower, which is again, how to shape apartments in a practical way, and yet give expression to every apartment, to every position. And of course, in terms of the central tower, how to create a piazza that, that is dimensional, not only two-dimensional, and how to create a composition that really relates to many other buildings, and not only to itself alone, and of course also to the scale and history of great buildings in Milan, like the Pirelli building, Torre Valesca, and so on. Uh, I'm also lucky to be now at the definitivo stage of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Milan, uh, a building based really on, uh, on one of the, the most incredible emblems, which is how to transform the uh, square into a circle, uh, the, the, the earthly into the heavenly, or the rational into the irrational. And uh, this is a museum of contemporary art, of course, it is uh, flexible, with flexible programming, but a museum that, that can accommodate the aspirations of contemporary exhibitions, video installations, public spaces, cafes, uh, rooftop gardens, and so on. So uh, that's really a work that is part of the city life, part of bringing culture to high-density living, to the park, to the office buildings, and to the composition of a large-scale set of neighborhoods. This is uh, the smallest project that I recently completed. It's a house uh, for two uh, art lovers in Connecticut. You can see it is, it's mathematical. It has to do with uh, the number of folds in the house, number of planes, number of points, and the number of intersections of the house. Uh, the house is located in, in Connecticut, very close to New York. And uh, the problem of the house was a very simple one. The, 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 the couple are art they told me they wanted a house to be in a work of art. They don't want any art in the house because they are surrounded with art all the time. So they wanted to create a house where you don't have to put anything on the walls, where you don't have to put any sculptures, where the spaces flow in a way which accommodates all the living activities in an artistic form. Uh, the house is stainless steel, uh, a, 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 a bronze stainless steel, very special. And the interior of the house is completely in wood. So it is, uh, it, it, and the penetrating walls of stainless steel intersect to create a fluid geometry of rooms. Uh, it's a, a difficult house to show in two dimensional form because it's an anti perspective house, it's a post perspective house. It's a house which does not allow itself to be photographed because the idea of the house is that there is no perspective in the house. Uh, it dissolves the perspectives of the living room, of the bedroom, uh, into something which is really part of connecting itself with the landscape of the house. And uh, of course, it is sighted in such a way as to create a, a, a way of living uh, with portraits, with light in different seasons that uh, really uh, match the life of uh, the inside with the external landscape. A very different project in Toronto, one of my favorite cities also. Uh, I call it a crystal because I was inspired by the crystals in the collection. It's the largest museum of Canada. Uh, and I was also uh, lucky to be able to renovate the old wings of this museum. Uh, it's a museum that has both large natural history collections, dinosaurs, the biggest collection in the world, but also great uh, 
collections of African art, of uh, Chinese art, Asian art. So it's like it's several museums in one a large museum. And uh, I reoriented the museum completely. This, uh, the, this was, used to be the back of the museum. I turned it into the front. I reoriented how the museum is seen uh, on the street in order to bring new energy to the city of Toronto. Uh, you can see the plan, you can see the old wings, you can see uh, the intersection between the old and the new, you can see the geometries which frame the views of the city, you can see the, the, the spaces that inter interact with the different uh, programs of the museum. And of course, again, the museum is like a kaleidoscope of the collections. It's a reflection of the different spatial aspects that combine very intimate works with sometimes very, very large works. So again, it's a museum that disperses the space in ways that are crystalline. And like a crystal, uh, creates an intersection. Uh, you can see that spirit house in the center of the building. And by the way, I used my drawings, those early drawings that you saw before, really to create the windows and the projections. The building itself is a projective uh, lantern, let us say, uh, because it reflects light in, in, in different ways, in different seasons. Uh, of course, it has large, uh, grand spaces. It has a, a round at the very top of the building, which is now one of the most popular restaurants in Toronto. It has radical geometries that transform the street space into a kind of three-dimensional public space because uh, I think it's important in a city not to just repeat the structure that was given but to create new ideas of public life. And of course, uh, the building is uh, one of the most popular museums uh, now in Canada with millions of visitors. Uh, of course, it was very radical. It was considered outrageous. It was considered uh, not possible, but it is very, very popular with audiences. So again, uh, I think it's important not just to listen to the critics, but to create spaces that are interactive and really publicly accessible. Uh, another build, uh, project I'm working on, Madison Avenue in New York, it, it's a, a skyscraper a residential tower. And uh, my idea was to create a sustainable tower which is not standing on a new space, but is on top of an existing building. It is at one Madison Park, and it's carved out to really create the pantheon idea on every level. So that it's a carved spiral within the building. And of course, to give every unit of the apartment a green space and make the tower permeable. So you can see through the tower, you can see the structure of the tower weaving through the space. And you can see the relationship of this tower to some very important historical buildings uh, on Madison Avenue and so on. And again, a tower that I think will contribute something new and not just to the skyline of New York, but to the living, to the possibility of, of having access to the green and also seeing a tower which is not just a stick in the air. So, uh, and my uh, last thing that I want to share with you, it's a, it's a strange juxtaposition, uh, but I have to tell you that I, I want to show you this photograph because many times people ask me, where was I on 9-11-2001? When was I on that day? And it's an interesting, interesting, uh, strange timing because September 11, 2001 was the first day that the Jewish Museum opened to the public. It was the first day the doors were opened. And I remember going to the studio this day and saying, this is great. Now, people can enter and see history. They can enter and see the story of Jewish Museum in Berlin. And of course, in the afternoon, at around 2 o'clock, 2.30, the museum closed its doors because of the attacks in New York. There was uncertainty. So the museum opened the doors at 10 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, 2.30, the doors were closed for three days. And I thought, you know, what a strange, connection 
because uh, as I watched uh, the fire in New York, I said, I want to return to New York. I want to uh, try to contribute something to this very, very tragic day. And I was lucky to win a very complicated competition uh, with a project called Memory from the Kit. Because it's not an easy project, it's highly political. There are many, many uh, stakeholders. There is the governor of New York, uh, the governor of New Jersey, the pack train authorities. Uh, there is the Port Authority of New York that owns the land. Uh, and just to tell you, that's an organization with 7,000 engineers and architects. 7,000. Very powerful. Uh, there is, of course, the private investors with their own architects and their own uh, capital ideas of what to do on the site. And of course, they're the victims and the families of those who perish. So it's a, it's a balancing act, how to create something that has to do with memory, a, a day that certainly changed the world and how we think about the world, but at the same time, something that is positive, something that gives something interesting back to New York, something that is uh, pluralistic, vital, interesting. And of course, that's why I was inspired by many things uh, that I know about New York, uh, which are not just symbols, the Statue of Liberty, uh, the flame of freedom, the possibility, the complexity of the city, the different uh, people. So, of course, one thing is to win a competition, another one is to build the, the project. It's easy to win a competition. It's easy to win a competition for the Jewish Museum in Berlin, but very difficult to build it. One thing I learned in Berlin, that architecture is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's not a short range running, it's a very long range thing, and you have to be a believer. You have to practice, you have to be patient, you cannot give up. And of course, that's the nature of this project. It has so many elements, so many thousands of interests. So much complexity, and yet I believe that the important part was to create a significant memorial. To create a memorial uh, that, that shows the depth of this site which is not just the surface, 16 acres, but really goes all the way down, many, many stories, 75 feet to the bedrock, and of course to expose uh, the foundations of the site to the public. And I indeed that is what, what is happening. There will be a museum which shows this catastrophic uh, section of New York, but also the inspiring uh, idea of New York that is built from the bedrock. Uh, another element which I introduced, I call the Word of Light. It's a, it's a major piazza, a, a, an additional piazza, where you enter the, 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 the memorial itself, uh, which is guided by the light of that fateful day, of the fateful attack. 8.46 a.m. when the first tower was struck, at 10.28 when the second tower collapsed. And I have to show you, on the left is my, the, the, the first kind of rendering of an idea back in 2003, and on the right is the latest rendering. And you know, it's actually pretty close, despite all the compromises that I have to do, and you have to do compromises, because we don't live in, in a totalitarian regime, we live in a democracy, where people have competing interests. But I'm proud that the fact that the site will not be completely covered with buildings, that there will be light, that there will be a, a symbolism at the center of the memorial, and yet that the towers will have a crown that does touch the heart of New York and the Statue of Liberty. Many different pieces, many different uh, interventions. Uh, the last uh, really picture of Ground Zero, and I want to tell you that this September 11th will be the opening of the memorial. Uh, the museum is almost finished. The Pat Terminal is underway. Uh, the Freedom Tower, or number one World Trade Center, is going to reach really the height uh, of, of, of a symbolic height, 1776. So a lot of the site will become accessible, and I think that's part of it, to, to, to take this hole in New York and to make it something humane, something meaningful, something that, that touches the heart. And uh, it, it, of, of course, that is the art of this project, how to uh, navigate uh, through the treacherous waters uh, of complex capital society and create something that is symbolic, that is moving, uh, and I just want to tell you that, uh, that this is a 16-acre site. I left more than half of it for public space, which is very difficult. 
more than eight acres are public space. And uh, the, in terms of the amount of building here, just to give you an idea, this is more buildings than most downtowns of America. There's more building here than downtown Denver, downtown Baltimore, downtown Washington. It's so much density. We're speaking about 15 million square feet of density, and yet to create the openness so that people can feel in the dark streets of Wall Street that there is light. And really, I end here where I really began, you know, because I'm an immigrant, several times. I was born in Poland. I was an immigrant to Israel. I was an immigrant to America. Uh, I'm a permanent immigrant. Uh, the fact is that uh, as a boy of 13, I stood on the deck of a ship coming to America uh, with my uh, sister, my mother, and looking at the skyline of New York and being really amazed at what human beings can do in a place that has possibilities of being free, a place that has opportunities, a place that isn't oppressed by governments that kill imagination and kill the human spirit. And that's why I thought about designing the building, that it is finally about liberty, about freedom, about the values of democracy. That's what I believe in, and that's, I think, what you will see this September and in the coming years as the project is completed. Thank you so much. Thank you.